coming to you now is Bread of His Presence with your host, Pastor Cameron Urie, Senior Pastor and Bible Teacher at Renton Park Chapel in Renton, Washington. Well, greetings and welcome again to Bread of His Presence. It's so good to have you with us today as once again we open the Word of God together. You know, one of the great promises of Scripture that we see repeated over and over again is the promise of God to be with us in every circumstance that you and I face. And that's been a major theme here in the closing chapters of the book of Genesis, especially in the Joseph narrative. Now, if you were to look at the initial chapters of his story, merely on the basis of what happened to him, it might seem on the surface that God was not with him. After all, he was hated by his brothers, he was seized and thrown into a pit by them, and then, of course, they sell him into slavery to this group of Midianite traders going down to Egypt. I mean, everything, quite literally, seems to be going south for him. And yet, as we'll see, God is very much with Joseph and has a plan and a purpose in all of this. God will bring him through every trial that he faces. But nevertheless, he does have to face those trials. You know, if God's role as our divine shepherd is to keep us out of pain and out of suffering, then he is a pretty lousy shepherd. Because we experience a lot of it. Even in reading the book of Psalms, we see this repeatedly expressed by the psalmist. David, for instance, writes in Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And David was one of those who was closest to God. One God even called a man after my own heart. And yet, God didn't take him around the valley. No, he took him directly through it. And what David discovered is what we often discover ourselves in times of trial, and which I think Joseph most certainly discovered. And that is that God's presence, his power, is most fully revealed to us during those times of suffering. And we certainly see that expressed in Joseph's life. He's carried down to Egypt. He's bought by the captain of Pharaoh's guards, who brings him into his household, and under any normal circumstance, would probably have had very little to do with Joseph ever again. But that's not what happens. No, he notices there is something special about Joseph. So much so that he not only brings him into his home, but eventually puts him in charge of his entire household. And the text explicitly tells us why. It says his master saw that the Lord, Yahweh, was with him. And that alone is such a remarkable phrase. Because it indicates that Joseph is fulfilling God's role for the Jewish people. God had chosen Abraham and his descendants to reveal his nature and his character to the world. And Jesus, the ultimate son of Abraham, who also happened to be the son of God, (laughs) just a minor note there, he was the ultimate revelation to us of the nature of God the greatest expression of his grace and provision for salvation. And you know what Luke chapter 2, verse 40 says of Jesus? And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. You see, it is the presence of God that makes all the difference in a person's life. And he wants to make just as much of a difference in your life and in my life as well. Now, if the story of Joseph had ended there in Potiphar's house, that would be enough 
to show us the grace and mercy of God. As although his brothers intended evil for him, he ended up being brought into a royal household. But that was not the end of God's plan for his life, because he had given Joseph, remember, some very specific prophetic dreams that had yet to come true. And what those dreams revealed was that God had a much bigger role for Joseph to play in a far grander plan of salvation. But as always happens, when God moves to bring about a great salvation, Satan engages in a counter-move. Think about this. The moment Jesus had begun his ministry, Satan met him in the desert and sought to derail God's plan of salvation. And similarly, here in Potiphar's house, Satan has raised up another member of that household, Potiphar's wife, to be a stumbling block for Joseph because of how integral Joseph was to God's plan to save his people, as well as all of Egypt and all the surrounding nations. It says in verse 7 of Genesis 39, After some time, his master's wife looked longingly at Joseph and said, Sleep with me. And so she notices that he's handsome, that he's well-built, and she decides, I want him. And the text says she looked longingly at Joseph. Now, in the original Hebrew, that phrase could also be transliterated as swept away by her eyes. I mean, Potiphar's wife was swept off her feet and carried away with her desire for this handsome and virile young man. But you know, Joseph's response is absolutely beautiful. It says, but he refused. Look, he said to his master's wife, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in his house, and he has put all that he owns under my authority. No one in this house is greater than I am. He has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. So how could I do this immense evil, and how could I sin against God. Now, Potiphar's wife doesn't give up. No, she keeps on pushing. She's like the adulteress in the book of Proverbs. Her words drip like honey day after day after day. But Joseph knows that her way will lead to death in the end. And so it says, Although she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her. He's not budging. He keeps refusing. And no doubt he tried to keep his distance from her as much as possible. But one day she manages to catch him all alone. It says, now one day he went into the house to do his work. And none of the household servants were there. I wonder if she had not found an errand to conveniently send them on. I don't know, it just sounds like a setup to me. But whatever the case, they are alone. And it says, she grabbed him by his garment and said, sleep with me. But leaving his garment in her hand, he escaped and ran outside. And that's what you and I need to do as well. <laughs> it's not always appropriate to fight temptation. Often we need to simply run from it. And this was one of those times. And after Joseph runs from her, we see the true nature of her heart. And it wasn't love. I'm sure you've heard the phrase, hell hath no fury, as a woman scorned. Well, that was certainly true of Potiphar's wife. If he won't give her what she wants, she will destroy him. And she suddenly sees that she has left in her hands the perfect tool by which she can do so. As it says, when she saw that he had left his garment with her and had run outside, she called her household servants. 
Look, she said to them, my husband brought a Hebrew man to make fools of us. He came to me so he could sleep with me, and I screamed as loud as I could. When he heard me screaming for help, he left his garment beside me and ran outside. Then it says, she put Joseph's garment beside her until his master came home. Then she told him the same story. The Hebrew slave you brought to us came to make a fool of me. But when I screamed for help, he left his garment beside me and ran outside. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, these are the things your slave did to me. He was furious and had him thrown into prison, where the king's prisoners were confined. So Joseph was there in prison. Now, it's highly probable that Potiphar did not fully believe what his wife was telling him. It may be also that Joseph may have had a chance to tell his side of the story. That isn't recorded, but neither is his reaction to his brothers throwing him into the pit. We find out what his reaction was later in their retelling of the story in Genesis 42, where it says he pleaded with us. And so Joseph might have tried to explain, and Potiphar, though angry at first, may have had doubts. One indication of that is seen in how he chooses to punish Joseph. Because the penalty for that kind of sin in that culture was death. Absolutely without question. But Potiphar opts not to do that. Which may indicate some level of doubt in his mind as to the veracity of his wife's story. Because he had known Joseph's character. His wife's character, on the other hand, was a little bit suspect. But perhaps even just to save face, he has Joseph thrown into the prison. And so for the second time, Joseph had his garment removed, followed by his then being thrown somewhere. First into a pit, and now a prison. But once again, though things once again seem to be getting worse... We're reminded in verse 21 of the fundamental truth relayed over and over again in and throughout this story. As it says, but the Lord, Yahweh, was with Joseph and extended kindness to him. He granted him favor with the prison warden. The warden put all the prisoners who were in the prison under Joseph's authority. And he was responsible for everything that was done there. The warden did not bother with anything under Joseph's authority because the Lord, Yahweh, was with him. And the Lord, Yahweh, made everything that he did successful. And as we will see, what was meant for evil only worked out for Joseph's good. As through his prison experience, he would come into contact with two guys, one of whom would be instrumental in bringing him to Pharaoh, who would then make Joseph second in command over all of Egypt. And by the way, as we'll see later on, Joseph is given a wife, Asenath, who bears him two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And he likely never would have gotten married had it not been for the evil done to him. And let me tell you the irony of this. Do you know what her father's name is? Potiphar. He's punished by one Potiphar only to be rewarded through another. God has such an amazing sense of humor. But you know, what we learn from this part of the story of Joseph is that God rewards those who keep holy unto him in every area of their lives, including their sexuality. You know, I was reminded just recently of something Dr. Dennis Kinlaw once said. He said, there's an important link between our purity in physical relationships and our vitality in spiritual relationships 
relationships. It's quite clear biblically that God's purposes for us are tied up with our sexuality. He can only accomplish his purposes in human history, in human society, and in human lives if his followers use their sexuality according to his design and his plan. I've noticed a startling truth in the history of the church, he says. The Holy Spirit has a particular affinity for people who are very careful in the sexual aspect of their lives. You'll have a difficult time finding an outpouring of the Holy Spirit among people where there is substantial sexual laxity. For some reason, purity and revival are linked inseparably together. God seems to have a particular sensitivity for protecting his creation in that way. Perhaps human sexuality is especially important to God, he says, because it's a prime symbol of the depth of intimacy that God desires with each and every human person. God uses most effectively those individuals who are committed to personal holiness and purity. And he seems to have a special blessing for groups who are committed to corporate holiness and purity. In our day, when such holy behavior is an anomaly, we need to set our course by his standards and not by the standards of the world. Whether you're married or single, young or old, are the thoughts, imaginations, and actions of your heart as pure as Jesus would have them be. If there's any impurity in you, he says you can expect spiritual impotence. And so with that in mind, let us choose to commit together, as Joseph did, to keep ourselves pure in this, but really every aspect of our lives, so that, just as Joseph was, we might be able to reflect and reveal God's nature and his character to those around us. Let's choose to do so this day and every day. Amen and amen. Today's episode of Bread of His Presence is brought to you by Renton Park Chapel, a church that is committed to the ministry of sharing the joy of hearing and doing God's Word and to the mission of bringing people into the life-giving presence of Jesus Christ in and through vibrant preaching, teaching, Bible study, prayer, and ministry to a world that is in desperate need of the healing touch of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to learn more about our ministry here at Renton Park Chapel or would like to subscribe to the Bread of His Presence podcast, you can visit us online at rentonparkchapel.org or breadofhispresence.org. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for listening. And may you know all the fullness of having in your life the Bread of the Presence of God.